Yeah, so I'm going to talk today about reinforcement learning. Um, it's a very introductory talk, so if you are familiar with this, you will feel bored. If you're not familiar, it will be helpful. Um, but I, before even like saying anything, I just would like to do something in the background before even like start talking about reinforcement learning. So please, sorry. I have a model that I will train while we are doing our presentation. And this model is trying using reinforcement learning to learn how to play the snake. Okay. Um, so quick explanation. So my snake is, is trying to, to learn how, how to eat the ball or whatever you call it. And every time the, the, the snake will eat, uh, he will get a score every time it hits a wall or, or like go inside itself, it will start again over. So we'll keep that running using reinforcement learning. And then once we finish the presentation, we'll, we'll come back and see if our snake can, can play the game very well or not. Hopefully. Sorry, like, Mohammed, sorry to interrupt, but like we can't hear you very well. We think, I think probably it's the issue with my, with the. Um, uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah, no, it's like breaking up. I think it's the issue is probably this thingy because it wasn't working. But I don't so know. The ones who are remotely, can they hear me? Can you yeah, hear me? Sounds good for me. Sorry? I can hear you, yeah. I can hear you fine. Yeah, I mean, the issue is with everyone talking, so I think the issue is ours. Should I just put it in the... Can you hear if I put it from here? Wait, sorry, let me just try. I don't think you would. Can you try to speak now? So can, can you hear me now? Can you hear now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I think it's still a second. Okay, we can we can watch the snake playing while you sort out the the sound issue. Hopefully, by the end of of the presentation, so that. So is the sound now fine? Can you confirm if you can hear me? Okay, perfect. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, yeah. So reinforcement learning trying to teach our baby how to walk. So um, in reinforcement learning, we are trying normally to learn a solution to a problem. That solution to the, to the problem is normally learned using agents. So this is our agent, the brain. Um, and the agents will normally interact with an environment. So assume that you have an environment that is the earth. And what happens is that the agent will observe states, different observations from the environment. And then based on these observations, they will perform action and then receive a reward on these actions. So our agent will look at the world, uh, get some observation and then perform actions there on the environment. And then based on these actions, uh, the agent will get reward regarding if the agent has done it correctly or not, that will be inherited in the reward. Um, and then based on the reward, they will use to update their behavior. So if you have done something wrong, they will try to do it correctly. If they have done something correctly, they will try to do it again. So where is reinforcement learning like actually located? So we know that, I mean, you are all familiar with, with this like um, introductory term, supervised learning. We have a set of data and we have target labels that represent the optimal decision that we would like to have. And then uh, the target define explicitly the relation that you are, you are trying to look for. Where we know that in unsupervised learning, we have also the data, but we do not have access to the target labels. And what we are trying to do is we would like to discover hidden structures within the data. So reinforcement learning, does that cover anything? Actually, the answer is no. So reinforcement learning is somehow similar to supervised learning in the way that we train an agent. This agent is a model based on rewards. Those rewards, you can call it labels, that, give up, that can give us a particular action taken in response to the environment. Um, and we would like to do that in order to generalize the environment we haven't seen before. It's also very close to unsupervised learning because we do not have set of examples of the optimal behavior that the model should do and that we can train against. However, we are not seeking to uncover hidden structures in the data that as what happening in unsupervised learning, but instead we are trying to maximize a reward signal. So as I've said, it's not, it's, it's not supervisor to tell you the optimal action. 
it's only a reward signal that you are getting from the environment based on the action that you're trying to do. Imagine that you have a baby, the baby is trying, the baby is trying to walk. If the baby falls down, he will get hurt. And this is the reward for him, like failing to know how to walk properly. Uh, on the other hand, the reward signal can, can be extremely delayed uh, from when the relevant action was taken. Um, it also has time series problem because some uh, subsequent environment state are, are highly correlated. Finally, the agent really influences the environment. Um, recent results, like reinforcement learning, recently have been used extremely and extensively in so many different applications to teach, for example, um, like how like how the computer can play the Atari game. Uh, Google recently um, like have developed uh, like uh, an AI system that can uh, play AlphaGo. And they were able actually to like to complete a strike for one series uh, victory. And also Google had, had itself like just gave a control over data center calling to an AI based on reinforcement learning. Um, so re future results, human learning, very closely to related to reinforcement learning. So how could we teach an agent to solve tasks which involve making decisions? The way that we do this is by using um, evaluative feedback in which we do not know the best decision, so, so the agent must evaluate how good its, um, its decisions are. So what happens? The same as what happens with any real world uh, like learning, uh, is that the agent will begin with no any knowledge about the environment. Then the agent will interact with that environment, and then the agent will use the information that is gained from these interactions in order to improve its behavior. So over time, the learning will slow, so the agent behavior will converge to the optimal. However, how would we know that the agent will use the information gained from these interactions so that it can improve its behavior? The way that when there are multiple ways of doing it, one, one, one of these ways is what we call K-armed bandit. Uh, to explain it, just imagine that you are in front of um, a machine with scale levers. Every time you pull a lever, you receive a reward that, let's call it RA. So you keep pulling, and every time you pull, like in, in one, two, or three, you keep getting rewards for every pull that you do. So that means that your reward is stochastic. So RA is sampled from a normal distribution. For example, it could be with a certain mean and a certain standard deviation. And then based on these different rewards that you get for every action that you do, you define what we call an active, um, an action value function, which is kind of the expected value of the rewards, the different reward that you are getting based on the set of actions that you are taking. Um, and here in this example, like for every action you have, for every action you get the reward, and this reward has a certain mean mu a. So, if our goal, for example, is to maximize the return over n, n time steps, over ten over n like poles, if you have a perfect knowledge of the of the queue, then you will pick the action that high simply that high that has the highest mean. So, for example, here you, you are, like you have, for example, we know that like action three. Will give you the highest mean and so this will be like the action that you will be taking because this will have like the highest reward um, and how you do that how do you do that you define a policy function so you have your queue function and then the only thing that you'd like to do is you'd like to maximize your queue function over the different set of actions that you are taking um, so however if we start with no knowledge about our queue function the problem is how should we behave? Because we don't know anything about the environment. And how would you approach this situation in real life, which is normally the scenario in all different kinds of reinforcement learning applications? And this brings us to um, what we call exploration versus explanation, in which you start with no knowledge. And what happens, like, and this is exactly what happens with every real world experiment that you do. Like when you start learning, when you start working, when you start teaching, whatever you'd like to do, anything, you start normally with knowledge, with zero knowledge. And this knowledge, um, you do not know anything about the environment that you are interact that you are you are interacting with. So you need to explore before you can do any kind of proper action in a systematic way. 
Um, so if you, for example, move to a new area, I think the first thing that you will do to know your best local takeaway is that you start exploring the area, right? So you go around different paths and after like a certain time, maybe after a week, you will know what's the best local takeaway or even less before that. So if this is what happens with real environment, this is what actually reinforcement learning is all built about. Is that at the beginning, you do not have any kind of information about the environment. So you start randomly, you start, you start exploring the field. Um, and then based on that, every time, every, if it's, if it's every random exploration, you get to learn some information about the environment and then you will become better and better with the time, like after every time you, like you, you do an action. And how do we do that? With epsilon greedy policy. So you define an exploration probability. You say, okay, this is my probability for exploration. I will let the model to go randomly at the beginning. Just go randomly, do whatever the model would like to do. Um, and then after a certain amount of time, every time we reduce this probability of randomness. Because with the time, the model starts to learn. And uh, like after each like iteration of learning, we do not want it to behave randomly, but we do not we want it to behave like in a systematic way. So you, you define this exploration um, probability, epsilon, and then you select an action. Like let's say for, for example, your action is X, that unif you uniformly sample that action. So if this is if this X is, is, is less than your epsilon, you, do, you, you tell your model, just do whatever you would like to do. Just explore the environment. Otherwise, if it's higher than the probability, then you choose your action based on uh, maximizing the Q function. And then based on that, you keep every time update your Q function. Um, just recall that like the Q star is actually the expected value of the set of reward over the time conditioned on the action that you will get. So for every action that you do, you get a set reward. As for example, is like pulling uh, over the calibers. Um, and this Q function is actually just the sum of the reward for pulling lever A, for example, over the number of times that we you have pulled lever A. If you pull it like six times, for example, every time you get a set of reward, and then your Q function is just like the average of this. Um, and then the useful information, like for updating the mean of Rn, is just like your your new Q value is the old one plus one over n, the reward that you will be getting minus your current. Uh, Q function. So this example for K for K arm bit, um, arm bandit is is very simple. For one state, it's easy because you you only have one arm. You can pull it as many times as you want. However, in general, in general, the environment will have so many states, and the agent actions will also influence which state the environment has to evolve to. Um, so the question now is, how can different goals be achieved within a uniform framework? The answer is we use what we call sequential decision making. And here you have your agent and the environment. So the agent will observe what's happening on the environment, then we'll perform certain action, we'll get a reward, then based on this reward, we'll like update its behavior. So in sequential decision making, what happens is you start the agent to start with current state, you perform certain action on that state you get a set reward. Then you go for the next state. You again perform another action on that state, and then you perform, you get a new reward, and you continue carrying that until the model become very, like has, has a very good experience. Uh, so let's, let's, give, let's give an example. You have this nice rabbit, and the rabbit would like to eat the carrot. Um, so in this example, so we would like to play this game, the rabbit, is only allowed to go up, down, right, or left. Uh, we will let the rabbit uh, at the beginning to have 50 chance of like going in a random direction. So the rabbit at the beginning doesn't have any information, so it will go randomly. But for every step that the rabbit does and it doesn't get him to eat the carrot, we will give him a reward of minus one because he, it, like the rabbit hasn't done something good. But once the rabbit like reach the, the carrot, we will give it like plus 10. So at time t0, our state is A, so the rabbit is at A. The action that we will tell the rabbit is, it's random. So let's pick go right, we don't know anything. 
So the action will be go right. So at state zero, the action that we will perform at state zero is go right, and the reward is zero because this is your initial state. So the rabbit will go right. So now the rabbit is at, at, at state B, and then the action that we will perform at state B randomly, let's make it right again. And but the reward in this in this case will be minus one because the rabbit is still having having got the card. Again, so now the rabbit is at action C. Um, this the action that we will be telling the rabbit to go. Uh, actually, sorry, this is left, it's not down. Sorry. So the action that we'll be telling the rabbit to do is to go left, and then the reward again is going to be minus one. So the rabbit will go left. Now. The action is so the rabbit is at B. Um, we'll tell the rabbit to go right. We'll give it minus one. Um, the rabbit will go to E. Again, we'll give it minus one. We'll continue until it reaches F. And then when, once it reaches F, that means that the reward that the rabbit will get is, is 10. So this, this is what happens at the beginning. So we start randomly. You do not have any kind of information about the environment. And then you just perform your actions randomly. Um, so every time you get a reward, and then the final G like, accumulated reward is like the reward that you get at time T plus T plus one plus T plus two, and you continue doing that. But bear in mind that you evaluate the reward at the current state to be the most valuable reward because this is the final or the latest action that you have done. And that is why we define normally a discount factor, a discount factor Call it gamma, and this like gamma is between zero and one. Um, so it sounds very easy. Like you can do that for every kind of application, but the problem is again you do not have a perfect knowledge of the environment, and we do not necessarily even have any knowledge about the environment at all. Okay, so how would we know what reward are we getting to get for our future actions? This is a very crucial point. And again, how do we decide what actions to take in each situation? And with, by going along this direction, it's, it's, it's becoming incredibly complex world function. That's why we define our agents, or nice people. So the components of agents are three. The first one is the policy function. The policy function will tell the agent how does the agent should behave. It's like, like the policy policy agreement or whatever you can call it. So the policy will fully specify the behavior of an agent. Um, like, for example, if it tells the agent, like it maps from a state to actions. So you could have a deterministic policy, like for every state you have a very specific policy, or you could have a stochastic policy that is a like a probability function for a certain action based on the current state, like which action should you take while you are at state S. The other component of the agent is a value function, which tells us how good it is to be in this state or perform this action. So it evaluates how good the state action is. Um, so we define what we call the state function, which is the expected value of our reward function based on the current state. And if you if you remember, if you substitute this G function with the, the like it's just half like this mathematical expression, and then we we also define the action value function. So the third component is the environment. So what are the dynamic of the environment? So an environmental model should predict what the environment will do next. So you'd like to know what the environment will will do next. So we define what we call transition function that tries to predict the next state. So it's kind of given state S bar, like predict the probability of a state S bar conditioned on state S and the action that we are taking on this state. And also importantly, we have what we call this reward function. And this reward function will try to predict the next reward based on the current reward. So it's kind of, you are at a certain state, you would like to predict the next state that you have to go to, if you are a rabbit, for example, at a state B, you would like to know the probability of going to state C, and you would like also to know in advance um, what's the next reward that you will be getting if you perform a certain action on the current state. For example, you know in advance that the reward that you will be getting if you touch fire, it's that the reward is going to be like you will get burned. 
So normally we would like our model to predict in future what the reward that the model will be getting uh, given the current state and the, the, the action that we will be performing on this current state. Um, so how would we do this learning from the environment? We do it by what we call model uh, free learning. And um, there are multiple ways of doing that using model free learning, but the one that is very important is, or like very popular is what we, what it's called Q tables. And it tells us that for a given problem, we can create a table with an entry for each state or action. So you have multiple states, you create a table, this table will tell us like it has a separate entry for each state or an action. And the aim of this table is to represent the value of each action state. And then the question will be if even if I have this table, how would we learn these values? And that happens through TDL is start with you initiate this queue table. And then you select an action. And based on this action, you perform this action. And then based on the action, you get a reward and you go for a new state. And then you update your key table and then you go again. So you select an action, you do that action. Based on the action, you get a reward and you go for the new state. And then you update your key table and then you do that circle until the model converges. Okay, so let's 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 show that with, with an example. So assume that we have three states, state one, state two, and state plus. So the reward at state zero, at state one is zero, the reward at two is zero, and uh, the reward at state three is, is plus five. So the actions, the set of actions that the model can do is left, right, or stay where you are, you move. Okay, so let's go again. So the first thing that we do is we initiate the queue table. So the queue table is we have two states, state one and state two. Uh, for each one of these states, we can perform left, right, or don't move. So we initiate our queue table with zeros. So now we select an action. And as I've said before, we start doing that randomly. Uh, so again, yeah, I assume that our policy is epsilon greedy. So let's go at the beginning, just randomly, let's go right. So the action we have selected, so it's, we are going to go right. So let's perform the action. We'll go right. Then we will receive a reward. So the reward that we will be receiving because we're having not anything, it's going to be zero. And then we have to update our queue table. And this is the tricky part here is how would you update the queue table? So the way that you update your queue table is by um, using this mathematical formula is that your Q value at the state T, given that you performed an action T, is the old Q value with a certain le learning rate. It's the Q value that you have acquired from the previous states, plus the reward that you have just got, like that you have just got by performing the current action, plus the maximum set of actions, like the maximum taken over the actions for the Q value based on the next state. So in another word, what I'm trying to say here is, what is the action that will maximize my Q value, assuming that I am on the next state? Um, and in Q learning, what you do is, you just choose the highest Q value that you have for your next state. Like, and that is independently of whether or not you have, you, or whether or not you will select that action. And this is what, normally called of, of policy uh, learning in, in Q learning. So let's assume, let's go back here. So let's assume that our, our gamma is, 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 is 0.1. Um, so using this, so we would like to update. So now I, we are at the state of updating our Q, our Q, our Q table. Uh, so we have, so the, the, so the agent went right, the reward is zero, and our A is, is 0.1, or it's like gamma. So the, the Q value that we will be getting is zero, okay, at this state, sorry. So now at the next state, we go right again. The reward that we will be getting is two, uh, is five. And if you, plot, if you plug that back here, so it, this is zero because we are terminating, and this is five. So the, the, the like, it's, we are getting 0.5 here. Because we, from state two, if we go right, we'll get 0.5. So what this table is trying to tell us is, 
what, what this table is trying to tell the model is if you are playing this game and you are at a state two, it's highly probable that you will succeed if you go right. But like, remember that this is just only the initial state. So once you finish the game, you go back again, start from zero, but you have your Q table as it is. Now you go right, you will be getting, because your previous reward is 0.5. And when you, when you multiply 0.5 with, 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 with um, like gamma is 0.1, so you will get 0.05. And then once you go for state two, you already, as you have said, you just like pick the action that will give you the maximum reward. And this will be, you just go right. So given this game, very simple game, we have learned an optimal state uh, action value function. And you start randomly and then you build your Q table and you keep playing, playing, playing the game every time and you're updating and updating your, your Q table. This is a very simple example, but you can just imagine that in, 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 in a case where you have like hundreds of states and hundreds of actions, you need to perform this um, like operation multiple times until you update your Q table. Um, so let's take another example of how this can be applied in um, another game. So you have your taxi, your yellow taxi, and this taxi um, lives in a, a five by five grid. You have walls and you have road. So the aim of, of, of this taxi is to pick up a passenger uh, at one of the four locations. So it's either red, green, blue, yellow. Sorry, this should be like yellow and blue. And then drop a passenger, uh, the passenger at one of these locations again. So you pick a passenger and then you drop him at one of these four locations. So always there are like six possible actions. It's either you go up, down, left, right. You drop off the passenger or you pick him off. So every time we will be giving minus one reward for each time step, plus 20 for the correct drop off and minus 10 for the incorrect drop off. It's, it, you always try to, to differentiate between the different actions so that the model will get like a high penalty for not performing the right actions. So for this very, very simple scenario, you will have roughly 500 possible states and six possible actions. I mean, the actions are clear. I mean, it's like six of them. It's like, but the states are, are really very big because you could be at, 20, at any of these five times five grid locations. And also the passenger could be at any, at any of five locations and you have four possible destinations. So for a very, very simple scenario, you have like five, 500 possible states and then your table is going to be 500 times, times six Q table. And again, you start randomly, you perform an action, you get a Q value, you perform the next action, you update your Q table and you continue playing the game or whatever, like 100, 1000 times. And then the model will be able to learn um, what the set of optimal action that it has to take for, for every possible scenario. The problem is the Q table is, is really very huge. Um, like for example, in a chess game, if you would like to do reinforcement learning using chess game, we have 10 times 47 Q table. And if you would like to use reinforcement learning to play the StarCraft game, then you have 10 times 2000 Q table, which is a very nice number. So while it's, it's really very nice, but it's inefficient. So how would we learn practically the Q value? We use simply deep Q learning. So when our Q like table is, is intractable, we can approximate use a function, and this function will be our neural network. So what happens is we have the multiple states. The only thing that we need to care about is now the states. Okay, so we have like six states. We define uh, a neural network with six states, and then we call our network deep Q network, and this network will tell us which action should we do. Okay. So you you and you keep learning every time with this neural network. Okay, so just final remarks. Uh, I've tried to use this and I've failed proudly. 
with applying reinforcement learning with image registration. Um, I'm saying proudly because it's working in terms of training, but um, like when, when I start doing validation, it, it's giving me like so weird behavior. Anyhow, I will tell you like practically how, how, how I've tried to do that, like doing like an affine image registration um, using reinforcement learning. So remember again, so we have an agent and this agent should interact with an environment. Uh, and then based on that, we perform certain actions and we receive a reward and then we update our behavior. Cool. Okay, so uh, so my environment in this case is every pair of uh, moving and a fixed image is like the, the pairs of the moving and fixed image are my environment. Okay, and then for each pair, I will be giving them an agent. So each agent will be responsible from the the pair, and the and the goal of the of the agent is to try to align the moving image to the fixed image. So my state is the, the pairs of the image. And then the actions that I have to take is very simple actions. It's either the agent will tell us, let's rotate left, right. Let's translate, let's move like to the left, to the right, and like other, other actions. And then the model is, is to learn this skew function. So what happens is you give the pair of the image for the agent. The agent will go for the neural network, um, get, get the action, and then Based on that, we'll, we'll perform the action. Then you feed in the second pair of images, goes to the agent. The agent will go for the neural network, and you continue doing like that until um, you converge. So, like practically, by the end of this, we should the model should know that for each pair of images, uh, should know the optimal set of actions. So, the, if I if I give the module, for example, two images, the, the module will should know based on the current set of these images that okay, let's first rotate by 30 degree, and then let's translate by whatever, and then rotate over the the z axis by certain certain degrees, and and so on and so forth. So we'll continue doing like that based on the current state. Um, but probably this failed, and I have no clue. And um, like I'm I'm just trying to trace. The issue, but still uh, have so many problems there, and I don't know still why is it not working properly. Um, so, some final rem remarks about nice things about reinforcement learning is it can be really powerful, and the good thing here is that uh, it's a good way to overcome non-differentiable functions. And what I mean by that is, normally the rewards are defined as an integer values, like at a step function. It's like Plus, plus one, minus one, plus 10, minus 10. So whatever cost function that you cannot fit in, um, like and differentiate your, 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 like use it in, in your neural network to back propagate through it, you can put at the reward function because the reward function doesn't need to be differentiable. And so you can put whatever complex, uh, um, like expression, mathematical expression into your reward function. Um, and it can also be used to, so I guess, uh, different strategies. And let's see if our snake have, have learned anything. Okay, yeah. So you can see that the snake is, is, is now learning how to play the game. It's still failing, but you can see that now it's using reinforcement learning. It's just, it knows where to go. And then like in, now it's like can reach a very high score and it's going very fast. So it still needs some time to properly play the game, but in like, you can see that in like, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, it can learn properly how, how to play the game. So it, it specifically go for the for the point, like for the red for the red point. And this is really like what powerful about it. Looks like it just train itself and learn how, how to play like the, the game without without any kind of, of intervention. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. So I'd like to keep watching my, my snake playing. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> I'm very proud, honestly. Yeah. Good. I think there's lots of questions in the, well, Simon's got lots of questions in the chat. Oh, okay, I didn't see the chat, sorry. Okay, let me see what's happening in the chat. Oh, Simon, you're making my life very hard. <laughs> okay. The... Sorry, I didn't see your questions, okay. Okay, so you are you are trying you are trying to optimize the reward or like in, in a neural network, 
what you are doing is you are you are pack propagating through your Q function. But the, ultimately is you would like to get as much reward as you would like to have within the model. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, but I mean, I guess there are like um, like in the simple examples that you show, maybe it's not the case, but in general, I guess there are like many set of actions that lead you to the like the same reward, like the final reward, right? Yeah. Like, do you have any control on the actions, or like it's just it can be like I don't know if you have two paths that goes to the same point, the final point. Like, can you decide on which way you go, or like put some constraints on the actions? Yeah, you will, and that and that is why you for like if you remember. Uh, okay, I will share my screen again, maybe. Um, if you recall, we were giving minus one for the actions that doesn't do anything. Okay, and that is why, and that, that's the reason it's that we would like the model to perform the action, but at the same time, we would like to perform, we would like the model to perform the action as quickly as possible. So if there are multiple paths of reaching like the destination, the model, while it reaches like its final destination, will be getting like reward in minus. So in the simple examples, you are trying, you are trying to get as less sum of reward as possible. Okay. Um, and this is just in the table from a, but in deep neural network, you are pack propagating through the Q function itself. Um, so in terms of discrete states, as far as I know, yes, you always have a set of discrete states. Like you go from state zero to state one to state two. Like you, state is, is just like the current situation. Like. Um, I'm not sure if I'm explaining in a proper way, but um, like, can you elaborate more of what do you mean by continuous state? Because no, I just feel I was, that I was more referring to the the example with the taxi. Like, um, I don't know, you could have like some like in the taxi. You, I mean, it was going down, up, left, right, and like yes. some actions. But you could could you have like some weird combinations or are you going like diagonals or like whatever like you know having like some yeah you you could have as much actions as you would like to okay. you could have as much as much actions as you would like to and yeah just just going back again for that like for the in the in the image in the image station part at the beginning so we started with having like a small set of actions like four just rotate by one degree to the left one degree to the right uh, and that's it but then I can make it even so so much complex that I can tell the model that you have like 1,000 actions, and those actions is move like where each point in the image can move to wherever you'd like to move. So it it could be like it could, it could it can go from like one or two actions to like whatever you would action, number of actions you'd like to have. But I think the problem is the more action that you have, then the more like complex your model becomes. Because it's directly proportional to the to the actions. You just get stuck in local minimal. You can get stuck into the so in the image registration in the image registration problem or which one? Yeah, I think in the image registration because you know like I mean what are what are your rewards? The thing about affine or rigid registration is that it's surprise you'd think it's simple but it's surprisingly hard. So like traditional methods for it often fail uh, mm -hmm. that's you know like how you found when you did the rigid rotation for ddr like msm doesn't cope very well if the rig the, reg the rotation required is too big and neither does mritk or it's only like flirt because it does a global search first you can very easily get stuck in a local minima or get stuck somewhere and then it just you know mm -hmm. it, it finds a solution and it just refuses it in continuous based optimization and it just won't won't move yeah. So I wonder whether there's like some way of either doing like one big global search to start off with um, and then refining. So where, like with um, with FLIRT for brain registration, it tries like the major big rotations to get the plane right first, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But there, maybe there's some extra penalties for like trivial solutions or certain solutions that you don't want that you could add in. 
Yeah, so what, what I did for, for that, so yeah, when I, when I started the problem, I had this issue. So it was like always stuck in, in, in a local minimum. And the way that to overcome this is, so the first thing is you need to, uh, to increase exploration. So at the beginning, you let the model to explore for a very long time. And that means to go randomly for, I don't know, for 1,000 times. And then every time you are calculating like, um, like in, in the image illustration part, so you are calculating the, the cross-correlation similarity, for example, let's say. And then the model have like some history about the optimal cross-correlation similarity. Here, the model is not learning anything. Like, okay, it's learning, but it's not learning the optimal path for the optimal. But at least the model will know that there is like a certain threshold where it has to go beyond it. And the second thing is um, in the reward function, there are, um, like one way of, of like, or like avoiding stacking is I've defined like, um, so if the model is stuck in a certain point, I will keep giving the model a minus, minus one, like a minus reward. And that will force the model actually to leave the current state. So if the model like gets stuck in, in, a, in a certain point, and I know that because I have like a random exploration at the beginning, I know that there is like a certain cross correlation similarity that is just below this level. I will keep giving the model minus one, minus one, minus one, and then the model will be forced actually to leave this like local minimum. Maybe there's like other costs though, like similarity itself might not be enough because like similarity seems to have these local cost moments. Maybe there's some information about like the problem that you can feed it. Like, I don't know, I'm not really thinking. I mean, diet overlap might be in brain. Yeah. Like, you know, if it's completely in the wrong orientation or something, then overlap of key structures or landmark distances or something might be. <laughs> Abdullah's got a question. Yeah, on oh, this no. on this particular topic, did you try like a delayed uh, reward? Can you elaborate more? What do you mean by delayed so reward? Delayed reward. I've only read about it years ago. So instead of like calculating the reward, like okay, you're aligned, it doesn't. It it like what it does is it calculates the reward that you're going to have in like 10 steps and um it kind of prioritizes what your rewards are going to be 10 steps later not your current reward it's a bit complicated so you have like a a k factor so you have the current reward but that's to the power of 0. Uh, 0. 0.1 and then where you would be 10 steps later would be like used as the full reward it's like a delayed reward so it encourages exploration because um, where your first step might be bad, but then your second step will be somewhat good. Also, have you tried just doing like a metropolis algorithm? Like literally just like not reinforcement learning, just seeing like uh, some kind of exploration. Like uh, so with 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 random. Uh, actually, that was that was one of the main issues. Like I was still not, not like quite sure. Right? So if I so practically when I increase the exploration so much. I can guarantee that the model will always converge to the optimal. Uh, like if I throw like a huge number of exploration, I let the model just explore for like, I don't know, the first half an hour and then start learning from there. But the model had to see the optimal, like it had to know the optimal, for example, dice overlap or cross correlation whatsoever. Like otherwise, um, I run into this issue in, in which if the model wasn't able to see the optimal at the beginning during the random exploration, there is no guarantee that it can convert to the optimal. What, what, uh, are, you when I finally, what are you registering? Were you, cause you was, were you doing like MNIST or something? I, I was doing MNIST, yeah. Isn't it not, do you think it's not easier to just do a, sl a slice of a brain volume? Like you could even just have a brain mask and you could give it a, you could just have a mask and you could give it a, left, right, up, you know, frontal, posterior, and that might be easier. It will be easier, but yeah, like it's like you have, like you are trying to align the regions only, or this is what you're referring to, like a very coarse alignment. Well, you, yeah, so instead of having it to start off without having an actual slice of a brain with all the intensity variation, you just have the brain mask, which obviously, you know, if you get it upside down, would also be perfect. So maybe you need an up and down, a left and right. But like, and then you could scale it up from there because MNIST, like, all the digits are handwritten, and then you know, there's no guarantee of getting a good overlap of the same digits, even if you've got it in affine alignment. Maybe you're better off with like a brain, which is an oval. 
Uh, honestly, I haven't, I haven't thought about it this way, but yeah, you might you might be right, honestly. Yeah. Maybe yeah, maybe I should give it a try. Uh, I was I was trying actually to say just to simplify the problem because the concept in itself was not was not like it's not it's not was not clear. And I wasn't like sure regarding how I can approach the problem this way. So I just needed very simple stuff. I okay, didn't if you want just to just like a, a mask with an up, down, left, right. Or, you know, if you wanted to stick with a sphere, just like have the whole thing with the cut somewhere and all it has to do is get the cut in the right place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that could be, yeah, that could be, that could be a way of doing it. I, yeah, I mean, I mean, there are, there are, the problem is there are so many factors to be, to be, to be added. The, the only the only thing that I see very powerful in this is, as I've said, I can define the reward wherever I would like to, and even if I have like an, an um, like an undifferentiable function, I can just like plug it into the reward, and then the model somehow like will learn will learn how to how to how to maximize that reward because it's not back propagating through the reward, it's back propagating through the Q function. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, and even even for the actions. So at the beginning, I started by having a neural network for the actions because. If like if if your two images are like ninety percent okay ninety degree misaligned, then um, like you need to know how much you should jump. Uh, and then I realized that this is not practical. So my actions became just go one step to the left, one step to the right, and stay where you are. So it's like like a set of three actions. I've simplified the actions, but I really yeah, think no. you'd be better off just doing a brain slice or a or a sphere with just the cut on it. It might be easier. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I, will, I will try. I will definitely give it a try. I will definitely give it a try. Just want to show again my snake. I'm very proud of this snake. So I'm <laughs> sorry, guys, to bother you with it is a snake multiple times, but it, like you can just be <laughs> still like you know it, it's, it specifically goes to the to the red point now, and you know that like it can just like. When it reaches the edges, it's just like turned directly. So yeah, it's it's so nice. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Sorry. 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 Uh, Sorry. What, what did you say? I wanted to see how many points the snake could get now. I can't hear you. Sorry, Mariana. Said <laughs> they want to know how how high a score the. Snake. Oh, okay. Yeah, we okay. To see but it's still it's still learning. Okay, but I, yeah, I can I, I can keep it. Yeah, but it's learning. I mean, I've 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 left it once like for a couple of hours and it was like getting like a crazy hundred score. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, and then and actually I'm setting the speed to be very high. So if I set it to be very small, like, but you can see like how is it going all around in a very clever way. So it's still yeah, it's still it's still dies, but. It's like now getting scored every time. So yeah, I mean, yeah, for, for this example, for example, so we started with just like random exploration. So at the beginning, it's like, um, I remember, I think I've said it like 3,000 experiments or something. So it just goes and then die, start again, keep doing that. And then, yeah. And then every time. It's, it's, it's really, it's really, yeah, it's really very powerful, but it's like, it's very frustrating at the same time because it's like. This is making obviously. me want to get my reward charts out for my kids because it really does work. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's yeah. re reinforcement learning for my parenting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be really good. I wish that yeah. worked on mine, but actually the snake thing might work on this route. She'll just be mesmerized by it. And then... <laughs> I promise you, like in two years' time, all you need to do is offer them stickers. Mm. <laughs> Works. Works a dream. Yeah. It's still, yeah, still, not, it's not, it's not conveying. But yeah, I mean, you can see, 